Hi cozy friends! Happy end of 2023! It's been a while since we've talked about exclusively gaming on a video and that's really just because I've been exploring my other hobbies and interests on this channel this year. However, we are returning to the roots today. One of my goals this past year was engaging with gaming in a more authentic way, in a way that felt honest to me. I started this because gaming is my passion and it's my safe space to go to and it started to become more of an obligation and as soon as I felt that I was like oh no 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 no. We need to step back and we need to look at how I'm engaging with gaming. But now after having done that for a full year and having had all of the time to like play the games I wanna play, focus on the games I wanna play for however long I wanna play them, I feel like I can come to you with this best of and worst of list for 2023 and give you truly thought out authentic impressions. So let's just jump right into it, okay? These are my favorite and best, in my opinion, cozy games from 2023. These aren't in any particular order, by the way, but I'm starting with Lego Fortnite because it is near and dear to my heart right now in this moment. It is my current obsession. I can't stop playing it and I'm having so much fun playing it with friends. I never thought I would have a Fortnite game on my best of cozy games list. Never, 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 never. But here we are, Lego Fortnite. <laughs> Lego Fortnite is a survival resource resource adventure game where you collect resources, you build and upgrade villages, you adventure with your IRL friends or with villagers, you fight off some enemies and you explore new biomes. It's very much Minecraft with a Lego skin, basically. <laughs> what I love about this game specifically is the scenery is beautiful. It definitely runs better on PC than it does on Switch. On Switch, you're getting a little bit of like lagging and background loading is a little bit slower. Realistic visual, but not because it's also Lego. It's just such a cool mashup. And such a unique environment to be in when you're playing. So I love that. And then I also love that the survival mode is fully customizable. Similar to Minecraft, like there's all of these customizable ways that you can play the survival mode so that it's most enjoyable for you or even just like easier or more difficult. And then I love that they have a full sandbox mode. Again, similar to Minecraft, it's really just Minecraft but Lego. They have a full sandbox mode where you can just build to your heart's content and like insert animals, insert enemies, and like kind of just do whatever you want. I also love that they've been doing updates. Like there was a storage stacking update, like an inventory stacking update that they did recently that I was like, oh my gosh, y'all are listening to us. Thank you. So I love the idea that they'll continue to like listen to players and update as needed. I really enjoy the village progression system. You have this village square that's kind of your central point where new Lego characters, new NPCs will come in and be like, I like your village. I might stay here and you're like please stay here and they're like I need a bed so then you build them a bed and then you can kind of build up your village from there. My hopes for the future of this game is that they continue to add new biomes and new like build types. Endless opportunity for them. They can just keep adding stuff if they'd like to so I really hope they do. My only complaint about this game is the building is so insufferable to me. I tried it on PC, I tried it on Switch, and I tried it on like mobile iPad and mobile with Amazon Luna. You can do like cloud-based gaming. All of them were so frustrating to build with. At the core of Lego is building a Lego set, right? And I just was so disincentivized to build. It's very tedious and blocky. You kind of have to like hop around and put each piece up and then go back to the menu to pick a new piece. And it's, it's, it's just so tedious. That's my only complaint though in a game of otherwise amazing features. Packed with so much fun. I typically like to play alone versus playing with people, but this is the game that I'm like bugging my friends to play. I'm like, come on, come on, another round, another round, let's go. It came out like last month, I think. Foresee myself playing this for months and months and months. My next favorite game that came out this year is Venba. Venba is a narrative-based cooking simulator where you're following an Indian mom, Venba, and her journey with her husband and her son in a new country. And throughout it, you really see in such a touch way how cooking is such a language of love and also how that can pass down through generations. I struggle to think of another narrative game that I've been so invested in each and every character because I think the character work is just so well done. The individual motivations are fleshed out. I also love and appreciate a narrative story that has purpose and intent to the emotions it's trying to evoke if that makes sense. It's not just having a sad character moment or putting a sad plot line in just to be an emotional storyline. This is sad because it's true. It's sad because it's honest and genuine. And that's what makes it a truly touching story. Not just because someone threw in something and said like, let's let's make this a sad one. You know what I mean? And then apart from the storyline, the actual cooking element and gameplay element of this was so enjoyable. The recipes were so fun. There were so many different types. The mechanics within them always differed. So it kind of felt like separate mini games with each new recipe. And some of the recipes had this kind of like figuring out puzzling element to it where you're like, okay, is it this? 
this stage or this stage. As soon as it got to a point where I got a little bit impatient with that, you figure it out. It never gets to a point where you're sitting there like, oh my God, I can't figure this out and I have to do it over and over and over. Because then that kind of takes away from the overall experience and even the narrative. So I feel like it does a really good job of setting you up for success in each of the recipes, but not too much. Like not so that it's so easy that you can mindlessly go through it. It really feels like the joy and nostalgia of Cookie Mama but grown up. Grown up with this incredibly moving narrative and characters that you are so, so invested in. My only critique on this one is I wish it were longer, which is not even a critique really. It's just like, oh, please just give us some DLC or something. Like I want more from the characters and I just want more recipes. Next is Paleo. Paleo is free, by the way, which is crazy still to me to this day. It's a cozy adventure role-playing MMO, which is a massive multiplayer online game, if you don't know. So in the game, you're playing with like other random people on the internet who are also running around in the same town and doing their own thing and fishing and catching bugs and stuff like that. But you don't have to like interact or anything. It kind of just feels more alive in my opinion. It's the first cozy MMO I've ever played and it really, really left an impression this year. I think they did so, so well. There's a lot of grinding in the beginning. You had to do a lot of resource collecting, but I think that's okay because the resource collecting is fun. Fishing is unique and engaging. The bug catching is really fun. And then the hunting, it kind of reminds me of Breath of the Wild. It feels very natural and smooth. I love that they update the game often and do events and stuff. The events were so fun. It felt like everybody kind of partaking in this real life event. I guess that's the point of MMOs is it feels like you're all kind of experiencing this game together in real life. Like the Chapa hunting event was so cute and so fun. I also really loved how it feels like you can spend your day doing anything you want. There's no like time constraint. There's no quests that are like, do this now, do this now. There's no constraints coming from any one place that are keeping you from just doing what you want to do every day. I think I would feel a little bit differently about that pacing if this were just like a regular regular farming sim. But I think in the context of MMOs, it makes so much sense. And it feels like this hideaway that you can pop into and just chill. Like you can just chill. I also love the uniqueness of it. I think it's really creative. Like the special animals and characters they come up with doesn't just feel like another farming sim. You kind of get invested in it because you're like, oh my God, the chopper. It just feels distinct. And I think that makes you want to come back to it more. My disclaimer with this one is that I haven't tried it on Switch yet, but I have heard it's a little bit more buggy and slow on Switch because it's a super like intense resource heavy game and it's an MMO. So it's gonna be a little bit harder to run on a Switch, but also it's free. So like, I don't know, it, it's free. <laughs> Next is Storyteller. I live for the drama, okay? And Storyteller supplies it. Storyteller is a narrative puzzle game where you shift around characters and plot points on kind of a grid of panels to achieve the right story outcome and move through the chapters. So when I first tried this game, which I played it on Netflix because it was free on Netflix and I was like, I might as well try it. I thought it was kind of like a free for all, kind of like a sandboxy style, like test out different outcomes, like make your own story. I thought that's what it was, but it's not. It's more of like this thought exercise puzzle style game where you're trying to reach a specific outcome and you have to organize all of the characters and plot points to get to this outcome. And that alone like added this little challenge that made it so fun and interesting and dynamic and like keeps you in it, keeps you invested for hours. And some of them are hard. Some of them are like actually difficult. You're staring at this blank panel of six boxes and you're like, I don't know, like I don't, bestie, I don't know. I think this one would be really, really fun to sit down and play with like friends or family, like all together in a room, just shouting at the screen like, no, the, the murder goes there. And then the Romeo goes here and Julia goes here because aren't cozy games that much more fun when we add a little chaos to it, right? Next is one I did not see coming this year at all and that is Hello Kitty Island Adventure. Hello Kitty is a town building simulator, but it's also kind of an adventure game. Think Animal Crossing mixed with Zelda games, like classic Zelda games. I was not expecting this. I picked up this game thinking it was truly just gonna be like Animal Crossing style town building. And that's kind of how it starts. You're, you're dropped down into this island after a plane crash, which is kind of morbid, but everyone survives. And all of these Hello Kitty Sanrio characters are on this island. Like, I'm yelling because that's so cute. That's like, what more could you want from a cute, cozy game? All of the Sanrio characters in one island together, please. You're all dropped down on this island. You immediately are there with Hello Kitty, my girl. Okay. And your aim is to like 
gift people gifts, befriend people, do little quests for people, and then get them to stay on this island. So at first I really thought that was it. And I was like, okay, this is cool. This, I'm, I'm vibing with this. Like you kind of walk around and you unlock new items at the store. It's just cutesy, cutesy, fun Animal Crossing. But then one of the quests is like, oh, go unlock, you know, these areas. And you're like, okay, how do I do that? All of a sudden you end up in this puzzle room, very reminiscent of classic Zelda games. So you end up in this little puzzle room where you kind of have to like puzzle your way through and get this star. I was shocked. I was like giddy when I was doing it. I was like, oh my God, there's like, there's a puzzle element to it. There's a puzzle element to it. It was so much fun to discover that and then know that there's still all of this really cute town village building game to explore. And the map is really big. I will say this was definitely like a quick burn for me. Is that the phrase? What's the phrase, y'all? Too bright, too fast. I was obsessed with this for like two weeks, played it nonstop, and then I kind of dropped it. But really so many games came out after that that stole my attention away that I, I don't think it says anything about the game itself. I wish I wish it were on other platforms because I think it would be getting a lot more attention and a lot more accolades and flowers than it's getting right now because it's just on Apple Arcade. A lot of people don't even know about Apple Arcade, but alas, alas, it's kind of tucked away in the Apple Arcade world, which if you're willing to journey out there, you will have a lovely time. Next is Mail Time, which is a cottagecore delivery, like mail delivery simulator. My immediate disclaimers for this, because I know this game had mixed reviews. I loved it. I feel like it was a cozy gamer's dream come to life, but I know some people didn't vibe with it as much. So here are my disclaimers for it. You have to really love and appreciate dialogue. You have to be someone who reads funny, cutesy dialogue and you're like, oh my God, that just made my day. That was so cute. If you are someone who kind of impatiently clicks through dialogue, that's me usually, okay, all the time. I do not be reading dialogue at all. And it affects my gameplay because I'm like, what am I supposed to do? However, when a game is dialogue focused, then I'll be like, okay, I'll, I'll look at the dialogue. And this game, most of its charm is in the dialogue. Unique and cute and quirky little characters. They're so cute and they stay with you forever. Like I still think about one of them to this day day, okay? So number one, you have to like dialogue. Number two, you have to like fetch task games. And those are games where basically the whole point of it is you going, hey villager, hey NPC, what can I do for you? Great, thank you for that quest. I will go do it and I will go bring it back to you. And that's kind of what the whole game is, which makes sense because it is a mail delivery game. Number one, like dialogue. Number two, like fetch tasks. And number three, it's really a platformer at its core, which I didn't really think about until people kind of started commenting about it. And I was like, y'all are right. So I think not every cozy gamer is used to or likes platformers. But for me, mail time, the platforming was really straightforward and it's not like meant to be a totally difficult platformer, but it is kind of a platformer at its core. You are like gliding and hopping and strategically getting up to different places to like deliver mail and see new characters. So I think all of those things are something to consider when you think about if you are going to like mail time as much as I do. But here's why I do like mail time. I feel like just a world within a game existing is important enough to me, especially when that world is something that like is a comfort to me. And to me, the world within mail time is a comfort to me. It is a cozy cottagecore dream. The characters are lovely and charming and whimsical. So admittedly, this is very much an environment based favorite for me. I'm just happy that somebody created this world that exists in a game <laughs> that I can go like bop around in. I wouldn't say like the narrative elements of it are like touching and are going to stay with me forever. But what will stay with me forever and why it is a favorite of mine is the world that was built. I think it was just so beautiful and so important. Like I just feel like we needed just to have this world exist and it does now in mail time and it makes me so happy. Next is Witchy Life Story. And this is on my favorites list for a very similar reason to Mail Time. I feel like this was plucked from the brains of every cozy gamer out there. Like if you were to say, what would the art direction look like of the absolute cutest witchy cozy cottagecore game? This would be it. The art design, the UI of all of the menus, the character design, the outfit design to perfection. I will say you do have to appreciate dialogue and point and clicks. I'm a big point and click girly. I love me some artifacts moondy games. I love a little check off boxes, get things done, collect an item, give it to somebody. That is something that's very calming and cozy for me. So this game was that plus the perfect aesthetic ever. It's very low stakes, task based, simple, straightforward, and it's pretty. 
I think that's valid. I think it's valid to just have a game that is kind of like a comfort environment for you. And these two are really that for me. Next on my list is Coral Island, which is a classic, classic farming sim. When you think of farming sim, that is Coral Island. But I think it adds so much to the genre and it expands on the genre, literally in scale of the actual game. And it expands on it in terms of expectation. The things you expect from a farming sim, it goes a little bit further. Like it adds this conservationist diving element that I think is really, really unique. So you're not just like, okay, I have to farm and then I have to mine and then I have to talk to villagers. It's also like, oh, I can also go dive in the ocean. And I think adding little things like that is always appreciated in the cozy gaming community where we are inundated with farming sims. Thank you. I'm, I do love it, but sometimes we want a little, a little sprinkle sprinkle, a little something different. And I think Coral Island does it so well. And then, like I said, with the scale, it is a huge game. It's massive. There's so many characters, so much to explore on the map. Like it, the map is huge. The houses are huge. The art style I love. Don't even get me started on the love interest. Oh my gosh, the love interest. Ah! Raphael, my man, my man, my man, Raphael. <laughs> oh my gosh, y'all. The love interests are phenomenal. The like diversity, phenomenal. It's like they took the farming sim genre and said, we're gonna take this to the farthest reaches we can. We're going to expand this as far far as we possibly can. You can tell so much work was put into it. One of the last things I love about this game is the events. I feel like the events are so fun and unique for farming sims. So it's giving you the, the events are on the calendar, you're booked and busy, but the events themselves are unique and interesting. There's like cultural elements to some of them. And then there's like mini games you could play. And I think it's very reasonably priced. Next is one that I think is very divisive, very contentious in this community. And that is Fay Farm. Listen, I'm 10 toes down. I am sticking to the fact that I love this dang game, y'all. I think it got a lot of criticism because of the price point. I think really it would not have gotten any real criticism if it weren't for the price point. And I get that. I feel that I get it. However, I do think it is a solid, solid game. Price aside, let's just, let's just shove price aside for now. I think it's so unique and the quality of life features in this game unmatched. So this is like a fairy adventure farming sim that was made with ease of play in mind. Like the developers specifically talk about how they are people who have played farming sims for ever and ever and ever and they know the qu little quality of life things that make it actually enjoyable to play and and kind of take away certain hurdles and frustrations about farming sims and take those away so that it's enjoyable to play there's so many little things i couldn't even point out like unlimited inventory and inventory pulling when you're crafting all things like that just quality of life things that make it so enjoyable to play that you almost don't think about it you're like this is how it should be at first you're like oh my gosh this is a breath of fresh air and then after a while you're like yeah this is how it should be and then you go back to other farming sims and you're like, mm, I don't wanna go to my chest. I love that there are kind of no bounds to the map. You can like hop around on anything. You can swim on anything. I think that's super unique to the farming sim genre. I love the little tea feature that you can make like a cold or hot tea on like a cold or hot day. I love the bug catching. Not the biggest fan of the fishing, to be honest. I wish the fishing were a little bit different. I am a huge fan of the caves mining combat part of this game, especially when you're playing with friends. Genuinely enjoyable to get through versus sometimes I feel like in farming sims, I'm like, oh my God, please, I don't wanna do this anymore. I'm tired of this grandpa. I will say in the beginning, I think it was a little bit buggier, especially on Switch to play with friends, but they've one, improved that. And then two on PC, it was never a problem. Like it ran so well. Now let's let's call back in $60 price tag. You can come back in now, thank you. Is it worth $60? I think that's up to you. I would pay $60 for it, but also this is like my job and <laughs> I am unhealthy obsessed with cozy games and trying every cozy game ever. So for me, it makes sense. For somebody who's like really trying to save their money for specific games that they will know that they love and continue to play, I would maybe wait for a sale. I would wait for a sale or do a lot more research on people's like gameplay and things like that to see if it has the similar mechanics of farming sims that you know you really get into and kind of become addicted to. Look out for those and then decide if you want to pay $60 for it. I really think that it could be worth it for for some people and it may not be worth it for other people. I know that's a non-answer, but I think that ultimately that's how you kind of have to approach any game. Like I can't tell you that it's gonna be worth $60 for you, but we will talk about games being objectively too expensive later on, okay? Because, ooh. Okay, and last for my favorite games that came out this year, because I'm gonna talk about some that I just played for the first time this year. Fresh Start. Oh my God, 
God, Fresh Start. I would not have known about Fresh Start unless I did a collaboration with them. I did a YouTube video with them. And sometimes that's what it takes for me to know that a game exists. And I'm so, so glad that I had the opportunity with them because this game is so, okay, power washing simulator, but cute and cozy and there's progression system and story that I don't know you care about more is more engaging power wash simulator you're like this is my job and I have to go get money for my job fresh start is like let's save the world let's clean up the world and leave it a better place to restore the cute animals and the nature around us hello like that's so cute so fresh start is a cleaning simulator point blank it's simple it's giving exactly what it's promising you if you are not a cleaning simulator fan you probably won't like this i don't know like it's very simple and it's very meditative and it's pacing the point is to kind of check out and calm down and relax while you're cleaning every single inch of this little nature area that you're in so if you are not a fan of games like that this might not be the game for you but if you are this is like the the one in my opinion this is the one i think you will love this over power washing simulator even though i love power washing simulator but i think this is a more like cozy nurturing version next are two games that i played for the first time this year but did not come out this year but they left such an impression that i have to talk about them this year okay number one is bug snacks i feel like i have not stopped talking about bug snacks since i've played it and i think that's valid i think that's valid because this hands down became one of my like top 10 if not five favorite games of all time as soon as I finished playing it honestly while I was playing it but then especially after I finished playing it like let me let me backtrack bug snacks is it's kind of hard to describe honestly it's like such a unique setup of a game that I'm like oh my god the developers were geniuses like who were the brains behind this it's an adventure game I suppose at its core but you are dropped down as a journalist in the town of Snacksburg which is kind of this like settlement community of grumpuses which are <laughs> This is really like how crazy this sounds. Of Grumpuses, which are these, these little, these little guys, okay? The Grumpuses are the main guys. You're a Grumpus in the game. Snacksburg is made up of Grumpuses who are all passionate in some way about little creatures called bug snacks, which are these little creatures that run around and they look like bugs, but also snacks. Kind of bug and kind of snack, you see. They are so cute. First of all, the bug snacks are just so cute. Like each time you discover a new bug snack, you're like, oh my God. It looks like a shish kebab, but also like an ant. But one of your tasks as the Grumpuses in Snacksburg is to go collect these different bug snacks. And each bug snacks has a different method of how to catch it. So there's this puzzle element of it. Sometimes it's super easy, sometimes it's super difficult. And then there's like big boss bug snacks you have to catch. Whenever I talk about this game, some people are like, it was too hard, like I couldn't figure out how to catch different bug snacks. And then other people are like, this is the best game I've ever laid my hands on. So I think if you know that you don't like kind of skill-based mechanisms in a game, maybe it's not for you but i would still try it because i am someone who also typically doesn't like those types of games but something about this game y'all i don't know if it's the cutesy little bug snacks i don't know if it's like the different tools you have to catch them i don't know if it's like the narrative i think it's i think it's everything everything is woven together so perfectly to create like a gripping narrative that you're invested in and then like progression in the game and collection and achievements that you're invested in i just think it's so well done and i think it's like the perfect perfect example of a perfectly made game. Truly not a single note. I think it is a perfectly made game. And I think that other game developers should look to it as an example of thought put into every single element of a game. Every time I played it and I had to stop playing it to go do something, I was like thinking about it. And then throughout the whole time playing it, I was like, I don't want this to end. I don't want this to end. I don't want this to end. And how few games nowadays do you think that? while playing. You know what I mean? I feel like that's really rare. And when you come across a game like that, you've got to yell it from the rooftops, which is what I've been trying to do with Bug Snacks, which is why I'm talking about it in 2023. I can cheat a little bit and say that this came out on mobile in 2023. So technically it still did come out. It was a 2023 release, technically. And supposedly it runs better on mobile than it does on Switch. I would try it on anything other than Switch. <laughs> if you only have Switch, I think it's still worth it to try. I would honestly just try it on mobile first because it's supposed to run like super well. 
So that's Bug Snacks. I don't think I'll ever stop talking about it, you guys. Oh, oh, I will say though, disclaimer, the end has like darker undertones. Don't go into it thinking it's like purely, purely cozy. For 90% of it, it is. It's like the coziest, cutest game ever. There are some darker undertones at the end, but I think it makes it that much more interesting. Okay, and the next one that didn't come out this year, but I played it for the first time this year is VR Chat. I had a friend get me into VR in general, like VR games. I had a VR headset for so long and just never really touched it because I didn't know where to start. And I had a friend who was like, wait, bestie, I love VR chat. I'll show you around. And I was like, isn't VR chat filled with like strangers and people who are mean to you because they're strangers on the internet? And she's like, no, I'll show you the way. I learned the way, which is just this glorious little place where there's so many different worlds to explore. So VR chat works similarly to like Fortnite or Roblox where people can create their own worlds and then you can choose to like go play that game or play that world. So VR chat's very much the same, which I didn't know. And you just pick a world to go into. So there's like a world where you can just feed ducks in a park like you are looking at it in VR and you are picking up a sandwich and feeding it to a duck how perfect is that but my absolute favorites were the worlds where you can just go in like this cozy little world my friend was like it's basically the cozy ambiance videos on YouTube but in a world like you're inside of one and I was like sign me up and we went to one and it was exactly like that there was one you can play chess and you can just talk to people and everyone has been so sweet anyone who we've come across is so 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 sweet and there's so many moderation options where you can like immediately block someone if they're being weird but I've never come across that all of the worlds I was going to everyone was looking for the same thing which is just like I want to chill out here I just want to chill out here and the best thing about it is that you can go into any world privately so you can make any world basically a private server where it's just you or it's like just you and your friends there's one world where you're just in a cozy room and you can like play stuff so you can watch like a netflix show you can binge a netflix show with your friend in this like cozy vr world and it's so cute and it's free next on my list are honorable mentions and i'll explain what that means the honorable mentions are either games that are not so cozy and or games that for whatever reason i am sure that i would love them because they they're widely loved because I played a similar game before, because I watched gameplay of it, because I played enough of it to know, whatever the reason, like I know it would for sure be on this list, but I just haven't played enough to comfortably be like, yeah, this is on my list. So instead, they're an honorable mention. The first one is Chia. Oh, Chia is this beautiful open world adventure game where you play as Chia, this young girl exploring the beautiful lands of New Caledonia. And she set out on a quest to save her father. My favorite part of this game is absolutely hands down the soul jumping. I think it makes the game so unique. I think it adds such a fun, engaging element to this game. You could literally soul jump into like any animal, even objects. I soul jumped into a can and was just hopping around, having a lovely time. It's just such a unique way to adventure and explore and an already open world beautiful land that you already want to adventure and explore but it kind of adds this additional fun element of like play and whimsy when you can explore as like a sea turtle or as a dog or as a can <laughs> the world is also beautiful and like rich in culture and the potential for exploration is just like so vast it's it's such a good open world and i played enough of it and watched enough gameplay on my friends streams that i know i love this game but i haven't finished it yet so that's why it's on honorable mentions. Okay, Dave the Diver. Oh, it is an, it's an adventure management game where you are deep sea exploring in the daytime and then running a sushi restaurant in the nighttime. So it's kind of like light casual combat roguelike elements when you're out there catching fish and then classic restaurant manager game diner dash type style by night where you're like collecting new recipes based on new fish you catch and like pouring drinks for people and like getting people in and out the door. I sat down, played a bit of this game, and I said, this game is gonna take a week of my life, knock a week of my life off the calendar, get its claws and grasp a whole week of my life and take it down into the depths. So that's why I didn't get into it as much as I wanted to because I simply didn't have a week to give to this game. I am like dying to give that week up to Dave the Diver because <laughs> I know I'll love it. I think you'll like this if you like the action kind of combat elements where it's more roguelike and you're going out there and you're catching as many fish as you can and you like that like high tempo restaurant management. I don't think this is necessarily a like cozy calm game but it's definitely one of those like comfort satisfying diner dash style that I think can be really comforting <laughs> it can be a time suck in the best way my last honorable mention is tears of the kingdom now I have like a hundred hours in tears of the kingdom but that is solely in map exploration and side quests because that is my jam like when I played breath of the wild I think I have over like 300 400 something hours in breath of the wild because I just loved adventuring I loved riding around my horse I loved hunting I loved selling 
selling things. I loved cooking, doing the little side quests and just exploring the map. When Tears of the Kingdom first came out, I was like, I already know what I'm gonna do for hundreds of hours. <laughs> Purely just exploring the map, getting the full map unlocked and then just like exploring little side quest elements. The main story for me takes like a backseat and I know the Zelda people are gonna be like, oh my gosh, scandalous, how dare you say that? But I was never a Zelda girly. I was purely a Breath of the Wild girly. That's the only Zelda game I've ever played is Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. And so my attachment to the franchise is solely in the fact that I love the open world exploration and freedom in those games. And so the story element definitely takes a backseat for me. And I know, I know, blasphemous, I know. So that's why this is on honorable mentions because just like Breath of the Wild, I love the open world exploration. It hit just the same as it did in Breath of the Wild with fun little new elements and new things to explore and new things to puzzle through. I, I absolutely love it. Have I actually like gone through the main storyline? No. <laughs> but I love this game to the moon and back. Okay, besties, now for my least favorite or the worst, <laughs> uh, cozy games of 2023. Because there are elements to these games that I did like. Ultimately, they either completely lost my interest or the pricing was so egregious that I just simply can't recommend it as a game, as a whole, as a package. <laughs> Okay, number one is Fashion Dreamer. I literally, on my notes, I have Fashion Dreamer in parentheses. Sorry, I'm so sorry, you guys. I was so excited about this. Sign in my hand, I am spearheading the girly pop game renaissance. Bring it back. We love the girly pop games from the Nintendo DS games. Bring them back please. That's why I was so excited for Fashion Dreamer. I was so excited. I was like, finally, the girly pop games are back. It fell flat for me. It fell flat for me. And especially at the price point of 50 US dollars, it fell flat for me. I felt like it was lacking in content. Were the outfits really cute? Yes. Did I think the styling was done well? Yes, I think the styling was done well. Did I feel like the outfits and clothes were mostly pretty modernized? Mostly, yes. I felt like it just fell flat in content and I don't think that it was worth $50. Ultimately just wish there was a story element and I understand that that was not the aim or the goal of the game, but I think that would have helped with the feeling of nothingness that this game offered to me personally. It's not style savvy, I get that. I think it would have added what I feel like this game is missing and what I feel like a lot of people feel like this game is missing. It's a digital closet. That's what it feels like. It feels like a digital closet. I don't think charging $50 for a digital closet is worth it. Now the rebuttals I've heard to that, developers are planning DLC, the developers are planning more content. It's gonna feel fully fleshed out and it's going to be worth $50. That's great. That is great. I'm happy to hear it because I did pay $50 for it. Happy to hear if there's gonna be something that's gonna draw me back in. However, I don't think it's right to release a game that is not worth the price you release it at and later add on stuff that you go, okay, well now it's worth the price. Now you can't say anything. How about we release it at $30 and then add on paid DLC I'd be, I'd be ecstatic. I'd be happy to give you more money for more content. That's how it works. <laughs> I think I give you more money. You give me more content. I'd be ecstatic about that. I don't understand why we were given a digital closet for $50 and then like told to sit there and wait while more content is coming. That's going to make it worth the $50. And I know some people were able to get it on sale, so it's a little bit more worth it for them. That's fine. Also, I, f I know for some people, the $50 is worth it. That's going back to my Fae Farm conversation. Like, I think for some people, they were like, I don't care. I've wanted a digital closet for so long on Switch. I am happy to pay $50 for it. And I'm like, bestie, great. I'm happy for you. Fantastic. But I think for the masses, for the regular, regular gamer, it's not worth $50. Nothing brought me back to it after playing around with it for two weeks. That's Fashion Dreamer. I really hope for more fun girly pop games. I even hope for Fashion Dreamer to come out with DLC that makes me backtrack and makes me go, okay, okay, no, 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 it is worth it. I love it, I love it now, it's perfect. I hope, I wish that, I do. But for now, it was my flop for 2023, I'm sorry. Next is Barbie Dreamhouse, <laughs> which this game technically didn't come out in 2023. It did on Switch, but it's been a mobile game for a long time because I played it when I was studying for the bar back in 2021 because I was like, I need a fun little girly pop game where I could turn my brain off and just play in a little Barbie dollhouse. You know what, at the time, it did what it needed to do. Even then I was like, this is a, this is a mobile game for sure. This is a mobile game for sure. You know what I mean? And, and I mean that as in pay to play mobile game for sure. That's, that was my impression. And so it only went so far. So color me surprised when I saw the same game was coming out on Switch. I said a mobile game is coming out on Switch for $40? 
what is going on here? And when I first heard about Barbie Dreamhouse, I was ecstatic. Once again, I'm so here for the girly pop games. I was ecstatic. I was imagining like a very simple kind of like fetch tasky cutesy game where you can customize the house and then you're like doing tasks for people or like even just like a narrative storyline. I would have been fine. Like I would have been excited about anything as long as there was like some gameplay. Like I just don't know how to describe the fact that there's like no real gameplay. It is very much like you have a Barbie dream house and you are playing in that Barbie dream house virtually. So like in the same way you would have a dream house in real life and you move the Barbies around and you play pretend with the Barbies and then you just like plop Barbies in a pool. That's what the game is, which, you know, it's named Barbie dream house. So that makes sense. It really just feels like it should have stayed a mobile game where it's something that, you know, like you pass to, to your iPad kid, just tapping around to tap around. I think that's fair and there's a space for that. But do I think it's $40 worth on Switch? No. However, I will say I made a review video on this on like my TikTok and Instagram and I kind of dragged it. But like one person mentioned in the comment, like I actually pay for this for my child and it's like a $10 monthly payment to like have access to all of the items, unlockable items in the game. So actually this is worth it for me because I only have to pay $40 now and then I have everything unlocked. My daughter can play with all of the little customizable, you know, clothes and thingy things that she had to pay $10 a month for. I'm like, you know what? That makes sense. And that made me realize maybe this is not for me. Maybe this is not for cozy gamers. <laughs> not everything is is actually meant for us. It's just meant for kids. And I think that makes sense and that's fine. I'm still putting it on my floppy flop list for 2023 because I just, I still think it's kind of the audacity of putting a free mobile game on Switch for $40 is just so interesting to me. But yeah, this this is not, as, as an adult, as an adult, is Barbie Dreamhouse gonna be something you like? Like that sounds so silly. As an adult, this is not like a fun nostalgic game to like dip into like maybe brats or something it's just not that you are gonna be disappointed sorry barbie dream house <laughs> okay my last floppies of the year is dreamlight valley where do I start? Ultimately, I think the microtransactions, they were the downfall of this game. I think the pursuit of money above all else is probably gonna be the downfall of any game. <laughs> but I think there's so many games that pull off paid content, paid add-ons, microtransactions, and still have an amazing game at its core. Dreamlight Valley fumbled the ball a little bit in that the balance of the game itself was affected by the microtransactions because they pushed too far, in my opinion say the star path for instance the amount of grinding you have to do to unlock the star path is ungodly the common person who is not playing that game in every waking moment apart from like their job and whatever else they have going on in their life the common person doesn't have time to grind as much as the star path requires and they know that it's balanced that way on purpose so that you are then incentivized or pushed to spend real money to unlock items and get through the star path and i think they did they they listened a little bit and they added a little things just to keep people still engaged in playing the game they added a few things like the the picture thing Thing, which to me is just like I want nothing to do with I actually like the photo parts of games the least they added little things so that you can get moonstones easier because before you would get what like 20 or 50 in a chest per day and that doesn't get you anything that doesn't get you anywhere with any of the items so they added a few things like the the photo element I don't even know what it's called because I haven't played it in so long but even that the amount of grinding and engagement you have to do with the game to like consistently get enough moonstones to buy any of the items is so much and it's exhausting I feel like they just exhausted people once you got through the main plot points there was nothing left that was really fun to do besides buy new items and when you basically can't get the new items without paying real money that's gonna that's gonna make some people drop off and it made me drop off so i think in general i'm disillusioned with the game i think the way that they've balanced the game i don't feel like they are balancing the gameplay mechanics and the amount you have to grind to receive xyz thing they're not balancing that with the player in mind they are not balancing that with fun in mind with like optimizing the actual entertainment of the game itself they're balancing it with money in mind i won't even get into the whole it was going to be free and now it's not and now they're still going to have microtransactions i'm not even going to get into all that because <laughs> 
just in terms of gameplay itself, this was just, just such a drastic drop off for me. And it didn't come out this year, but because it has content that releases each year and it had new content that released this year, I feel like we can talk about it. And what I wanna say about it is I don't like it anymore. <laughs> I do still recommend it to people. If people are like, what's a good game to like get into cozy gaming for the first time? I think it's an excellent game to introduce someone to gaming as a whole. The familiar characters, the familiar NPCs, you don't have to like learn new characters. You already recognize like Mickey and Donald and stuff like that. And then I think it does a good job at like tutorial level. Like this is how you play a game. <laughs> this is how you farm. This is how you talk to people. This is how you move things around. I think it does a good job at that. So I do recommend this to people when they're a new gamer looking for something, but I don't recommend this to like long-standing cozy gamers who are like, is this a good farming village town building game compared to another one? I'm gonna say it's fun for a little bit. It is fun for a little bit, but then there's kind of nothing left. And you know what? Maybe that's fair. It, this was on my favorites last year. Maybe the game served its purpose for me already. And now it doesn't uh, owe me anything, you know? And you know, maybe that's fine. However, I just had to add it to this list because of how steep of a drop off it was in interest for me this year. Those were all of my favorites and least favorites, best and worst cozy games of 2023. I hope this was entertaining and I hope it was worth the year gap of no game roundups for me. <laughs> I just feel like the end of the year roundups are like where you really get true impressions like I hear you like this I hear you like this but what truly is your favorite these were them for me or my least favorite I would love to hear if you agree or disagree I love discourse okay bring it on I love to hear it and I'd love to hear your favorites for the year if it wasn't on this list or least favorites if it wasn't on this list or was on this list but was on my favorites I'm so excited for more cozy games in 2024 definitely follow me on my other socials where I consistently am talking about cozy games on Instagram and TikTok and playing them on Twitch and on YouTube it's more lifestyle but definitely this year I do want to sprinkle in a little bit more discussions on cozy games and I always talk about them in my favorite videos as well. So that's it for 2023. It was such a good year for cozy games and I cannot wait for 2024. Have an amazing new year's. I love you. Stay cozy. Bye.